So um, I'd like to introduce Helen Miles, who is a mosaic artist, teacher, and author. She trained in Greece and resides in Scotland. And her first book is going to be coming out in um, March, 2023. Uh, it's called Mosaics, Ancient Techniques to Contemporary Art. We're thrilled to have you, Helen. Um, so I'm gonna um, give the program over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here. I'm very excited about it. Um, I actually, I'll just give you a little, um, another biographical detail, which is that my mother is American. So I spent a lot of time in Connecticut and New York in Old Saybrook, if anyone knows Old Saybrook <laughs> and Essex, Connecticut. Um, anyway, so, um, what I'm going to be talking about, as you know, is the Roman rules of mosaic making and uh, andamento and line building, and they're all interconnected. And it is a very big subject, so I'm not going to be able to cover it all in uh, the next 40 minutes or however long we have. Um, but I have, I, I I'm going, I, I feel it's incredibly important to talk about Roman mosaics and what they can teach us in order for us to make contemporary mosaics and what we can, what we can learn from them. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, so they're very, there are connections between ancient mosaics and contemporary mosaics. And I think they're connections that very few people talk about or think about. And I'm starting with this slide because it's just uh, an astonishing mosaic, which I, which I, every time I look at it, it fills my heart with joy. And I'm sure many of you uh, will know it. It's uh, Noriev's tomb in Paris. And obviously it's a contemporary mosaic. It was un unveiled in the 1990s. And then again, this, this is just, because I find them so astonishing. The New York subway mosaics, this is um, William Wegman and his dogs. And of course there are so many different um, the artists and mosaics in the New York subway. Um, and they are incredibly inspiring. But when you look at mosaics like these, and when you look at ancient mosaics, you wouldn't necessarily think there are direct connections and it's these direct connections or these, these themes or principles that I really want to talk about that, that connect them all. So here I'm just starting at the very, very beginning of mosaic, which, and this, uh, these columns come from the city of Ur in Mesopotamia, and they date from 5,000 years ago. So this was when in a sense, mosaic first started when we first see things being collected and gathered and sorted in order to make decorative patterns. But it wasn't really until quite a, lot, a long time later, about 500 BC um, in Greece that we get the first real mosaics. And these, this is from the palace of Philip II, who was, Alexander the Great's father, and it's in Pella in Greece. Um, so very quickly, I just want to show you, before we get onto the actual rules of Roman mosaic making, which is what I promised to talk about, I want to show you in, in very brief terms why ancient mosaics are, are, are relevant to contemporary mosaics. So if you, if you look at a mosaic like this, which is in the Bardo Museum in, in Tunisia, you can see that the design, well, if, if you're familiar at all with Roman mosaics, you can see that the designs in general are extremely um, sensitive and, and expertly thought out. So there's always, even on, for, for, uh, either on a small scale or, or a much larger scale, there's space to see and appreciate the detail. So if you look at the spacing in ancient mosaics, and then you look at the spacing in contemporary mosaics, this is from um, 
This is Eduardo Palozzi in uh, the London Tube. You can see that the kind of principle of leaving space and breath between, between the elements of the mosaic is a common, a common thread from ancient times to contemporary times. Uh, the other, one of the other principles, because I'm not going to go into all of them, is the principle of contrast. So when the ancients were working, um, they obviously mostly only had access to stone and some ceramic and a bit of glass. And they relied on contrast between tones and colors and, and to, in order to bring out the design. This is an incredibly kind of simple example, but I think it's a very effective one. And here's a very, you know, the opposite end of the extreme. This is a contemporary mosaic by a Scottish artist called Joanna Castle. And here we have the same idea of contrast. So you've got the very smooth, not quite polished because it's matte surface of the concrete on the left, and then this and the and the shimmery shininess and, and bittiness of the mosaic on the right. And it's the contrast between these two things that makes this work successful. Because if you sort of imaginatively split off the left, uh, you'd have a pretty boring mosaic, I would, I would argue, on the right. But it's the two together that make it a, a really great work. Um, another principle of ancient mosaics is the principle of color blending. So colors don't just work in bands or move sharply from one color to the next. So here, this is a detail from a Byzantine mosaic in the Museum of Thessaloniki. And you've got the black outline of the, it's a bird. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and then that moves gradually into the kind of red of the body. And then it's that that red is interspersed with ochre yellow, and then the yellow is interspersed with white. And that's how, because we're mosaicists, not painters, we grade colors. And you see that um, in contemporary mosaics, of course. So this is, um, I hope you're all familiar with this amazing, mosaic is from the, uh, the um, ruins project in Pennsylvania and it's the heat map by um, Caitlin, Caitlin Hepworth and Marion Shapiro and you can see that the, um, there are oranges interspersed into the reds and there are yellows interspersed into the oranges so the idea of color gradation is the same principle that we've had with us since the earliest times. And then the other, the other, um, I think this is the last principle I want to deal with before we get onto the rules, is the idea of placement. And so if you look closely at Roman mosaics, you can see that very few tesserae are often used to create, to give a sense of what the artist or the maker is trying to convey. So if you look at the um, eye here of the dog or the teeth, so you've only got, uh, six tesserae and that's all you need in the eye of the dog to create an expression and a mood and it's the same with the teeth I mean obviously a, a dog has a lot more teeth than that um, but the careful placement of the important tesserae is is a function a, a principle of mosaics and a function of them which is consistent through the centuries um, and you might, uh, again, be aware of this is by Luca Barberini in Ravenna, and he's very famous for these lovely little figures. And you can see, again, the same idea uh, that I'm trying to explain. You know, this is a face made out of one, two, three, four, five tesserae. And yet, because they're placed carefully, there's expression, there's mood, there's character, there's moment, you know, you can see that he's, you know, he's tripping, he's about to fall over and he's going, ah, and that's just by the careful placement of Tesserae. So now we are going to talk about the principles of Roman, of ancient mosaics. And some of these principles are true of contemporary mosaics and some are not. And I'll indicate where, when that is the case. 
But if you if you examine, and I'm not the only one that has done it, obviously, if you examine ancient mosaics of details, you will see that they have these mosaic principles as their kind of coordinating features. So the first and, and obvious principle is that they don't use grids. Because when you use a grid, uh, you're creating lines between the tesserae. So when you're making a tesserae um, and making a mosaic, and the mosaic, whether it's contemporary or, or classical, isn't just about the tesserae themselves, it's about the interstices between the tesserae. So if you lay your tesserae in grids, you create these straight horizontal and vertical lines and crosses, which create areas of interest or focal points, which you, which you don't want. So the way that the ancients did this was to offset them like a brick wall. And this is also true in, in contemporary mosaics. So this is a little detail from Emma Biggs. And you can see that all of the tests are beautifully offset. And in looking at ancient mosaics up close, um, these, some of them are not perfectly offset, um, but most of them are. Um, so th this is quite a good example from Mount Nebo in Jordan. Um, so if you just take a few seconds to look at the tesserae, all of them are offset. And then looking at this one from Jeresh, Jeresh in Jordan, you can see that the way to offset is just by adding every now and again, adding a smaller pieces, um, which therefore push, if you've got regu regular sized tesserae, they push them um, out of, you know, like off, they offset them. So that's how you do it. Um, but of course, you know, offsetting isn't is just one, one principle. The other principle is that, that would just, that gets rid of vertical lines, but you're still left with horizontal ones. So to avoid horizontal lines, uh, you need to tilt the tesserae so that they break into the horizontal line above and below them. So another, another, the second principle is about keeping the gaps between the tesserae consistent. So many of the rules of ancient mosaics are, are about um, kind of visual harmony. So you want the eye to fall where you choose the eye to fall, not where you just, by mistake, the eye will, will happen to fall. So if you've got inconsistencies in the spacing, then the eye will naturally be attracted to those places. Uh, and again, looking at ancient mosaics, you can see that the spacing is extremely consistent. And of course, there's great variety in the standard and the craftsmanship and the style of ancient mosaics. But still, within a particular work, the spacing will be more or less the same. And this is just a a close-up of, of, of a mosaic. I did a, a copy of something a long time ago, which illustrates what I mean about the spacing being consistent. And that, that, that's a choice. I mean, you can obviously choose to have the tesserae very close together or further apart or whatever, but within your piece and within your choice, you want to have consistency. Um, so this is a piece by Rachel Sager of the Ruins Project. Um, and you can see that besides the, um, the negative space that runs through the middle, the sort of river-like um, line, uh, which, isn't, which is free of tesserae, all of the other tesserae, despite the fact they're, they're very different sizes and moving in different directions, the spacing is very consistent. And that's deliberate, of course. And um, moving on from this, the size of the tesserae is also consistent. And this applies to classical mosaics rather than um, contemporary ones. So if you throw in, if you have a larger piece against smaller pieces, obviously, or smaller pieces against larger, whatever, you'll obviously find that the, that will attract the eye. That will be a focal point that you don't want. 
So again, looking at ancient mosaics, you can see that there's, there's very um, consistent sizes. So here in this fish, the, the sizes of the tesserae behind the, the, behind the eye and the gill are considerably smaller than the ones in the background, um, but they're still within a range of consistency. So the kind of rule, if you want to call it that, is that if there is an average size in the piece, in, in, a, in a Roman mosaic, the pieces won't vary between, will, will vary, sorry, between one and a half times larger than that average size and one and a half times smaller. So there is variation in the size. Um, and obviously that the, all the pieces are hand cut, so there's bound to be variation, but they're all within a certain limit. Um, and I think this is a really lovely example. It's um, a lettering from a um, 5th, 6th century synagogue um, from Tunisia. Um, and I just think it's a good example because uh, it would make sense to use different sizes um, and different shapes in something like this. It would be much easier to have rec rectangles, for example, and to fill the fiddly little spaces with single pieces rather than to use individual pieces. But you can see that the, the craftsperson has, is keeping to that, that principle of, of consistency in size. And then I just put this in because it's beautiful, but also because, um, as you know, in contemporary mosaics, there's enormous inconsistency of size. And that's part of the beauty of contemporary mosaic and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a divergence from, from ancient ones. So using keystones to create curves, um, I don't know if the sun is bright here. Um, so this is a keystone. And you create a keystone by cutting a square at a diagonal on, on the two parallel sides. And a keystone is just another way of creating harmony in a piece so that the eye falls where you want it to. So it creates smooth curves. Um, and this is a, a really clear example of how keystones are used in a, in a tight circle. So the smaller your circle, the more the keystones that you need to use. Um, and Roman mosaics tend to be, or not always, um, on a large scale and covering floors. Um, so there are fewer keystones in, in Roman mosaics than there might be in work that we do, which is classical. Um, but I've pointed, put arrows on this photograph to show you where keystones have been applied. And here's another, another very clear example just behind the peacock's eye. Um, so triangles. Triangles, both with contemporary and, and with more classical work, are something you have to, you, we all use, but we need to use them judiciously. We need to use them with care and attention because, of course, a triangle is essentially a little arrow. So if you're not careful, a triangle will just um, point at something that you don't want it to point at. So the simplest way to avoid um, using a, a triangle as an arrow is to just nip off the tip. Um, because obviously there, there'll be spaces that you need to fill which will have arrow-like triangular spaces, um, but to make them less triangular, you just nip off the tip. Uh, and this is a lovely example from the Chicago Art Institute um, of a seated dog. Um, and you can see that there are triangles used, but they're used away from the main design, away from the body of the, the dog, so they're not distracting. And here is another nice, nice example, um, this is from Tunisia again. And these leaves, um, you would think, would naturally be end, end in a point, end in a triangle. But you can see that they all end in um, squares. 
Um, and where there are triangles, most of them, like on the on the um, sort of greener side rather than the yellower side, um, and within the leaves, you can see that they're nipped off. So th this is something uh, which I mentioned earlier about the design of Roman mosaics, of ancient mosaics, and how every element has given space to breathe. So if you look at this, which I think is just a beautiful, beautiful hunting scene, you can see the, the whip in the hands of the, the front rider, or the, the rope in the hands of the boy on the ground, or I mean, every part of this mosaic, um, you can clearly read. So um, here's, here's another example. There's a lot going on. There's obviously an urn with this big agapanthus pipe stylized plant coming out of it and there's the birds and the fruit and the ribbon around the edge um, but each part of it is very easy to understand and to be instantly read um, so this is just um, an example of something that I did quite a long time ago um, of, of these birds um, so it's the, it's the principle of space leaving leaving the elements within the work to have space around them so that the eye can focus on, on the part that you want it to focus on. And then the border adds in a kind of extra dimension, which makes the work more, more interesting. And you can see it in a much more um, kind of profound scale on this beautiful, beautiful work by the Hack Hackney Mosaic Project, which is um, a community group based in London. Um, and it's entirely, um, um, worked by volunteers who are people um, who are recovering from drug and alcohol abuse um, and the, the designs are done by Tessa Hunkin who's a very famous mosaicist on, on this side of the pond um, and you can see in this design that there's a lot happening with these two ovals um, sort of companion ovals mirror, mirror images and then the black and white kind of stripes and dots in between and, and then this beautiful border and lettering but beside bes despite the fact that so much is happening every part of this mosaic is clearly is clearly readable um and i just put this in because <laughs> because sometimes the ancients as as with all of us got it wrong so here's a here's a deer which is um you can see its front legs have got kind of mixed up with the border, um, which isn't isn't ideal. So another another principle of ancient mosaics, um, very much, is that when when so you have the the set, the main design or designs because there'll be lots of different elements. Let's say the main element, and then around that element. There are there is a outline in the color of the background, so you can see it very clearly in ancient mosaics. So if you look at the this head of the horse, if you look at the the face and the back of the neck, you can see that you've got the horizontal tesserae in the back in the background color, and then you've also got the outline running around the shape of the head. And you see it again here, very clearly, around the face of the bull and the legs. And again here. Um, I think that's, that should be super clear. Oh, and I, I love this little example because you've got the outline. You've got the, this is a pail, um, a bucket. And you've got the outline which goes around the top of the pail and halfway down the side is in the white of the background. And then the outline changes color according to where the pail is sitting on the ground. So then it changes into the sort of um, greeny line of the, uh, of the floor and then to the darker shade on the, in the shadow and then so on around the pail. 
But not all mosaics, and certainly not all contemporary mosaics, of course, um, have this outline. So this is an example, a uh, Byzantine example from the uh, Byzantine Museum in Thessaloniki. And it's just because it's in a museum, you can see it up close, which is quite helpful. And you can see that there's no outline around either the urn or the peacock. However, this is a, a contemporary, well, fairly contemporary, 100 years old um, example from um, Chicago, the Chicago um, Art Center, is what I think it's called. Um, and you can see the outline is used here very clearly, even on this very kind of delicate uh, detail within a much larger design. Here is Palozzi again at, um, in the Tottenham Court Road tube station in London. Um, he has no, doesn't use outlines. This is Jim Backer at, in Chicago, the Thorndale tube sta uh, metro station. And again, there's no outline. So the tesserae run right up to the figure, right up to the element. Um, and here's a really interesting example from Mark Chagall and the Four Seasons in Chicago. And you can see if you look closely, if you look at the right hand figure um, along his left side, you can see there is an outline. Or maybe the left hand figure is even clearer. So the woman, um, you can see there's an outline which kind of picks up the colors from the woman's clothing on one side, but then on the other, there is no outline. And then the, another principle which is common to both ancient and contemporary mosaics is the principle of stoppia mentum. This is a beautiful word, which means to split in Italian. And the, the, this is used all the time in ancient mosaics and in contemporary mosaics. So the, bas the basic idea is when you're filling a space, whether it's an abstract or a, or a figurative work, and the space gets larger, then you, then you have to deal with that by um, splitting the line. So if you, if you were just to go along that line by your tesserae getting la larger in order to fit the space, then you would be creating a focal point, an area of interest which would attract the eye because it wouldn't be harmonious with other parts of the mosaic. So to avoid doing this, you split the line in two, and that's called stoppio mensum. And then obviously, if you're going from a wider space into a narrower space, you'd also have the, you'd have it, but in reverse, two into one. And you can see that really clearly in ancient mosaics. So the arrows are pointing to where the split is occurring. And I haven't put arrows on this one because I just think it's just such a beautiful example um, and very, very, very clear. Um, so this is from the second century AD and it's in the Louvre Museum and it's a, a man's leg. Um, you can see how beautiful splitting um, in, this, in the centre part, it's, it's most clear. I hope you can see that. And then this is just a little um, example by Julie Sperling to show how, how essential this, this principle is to contemporary mosaic as well, where the lines are splitting and joining and rejoining. So now we're going to just look in a little bit more detail about the principle of stoppio mento because it's really important to um, both ancient and contemporary mosaics. So for this, I've just I've just uh, drawn this shape, um, for sort of indicative but not obviously precise of of um, well, it could be anything. It could be a wing tip. It could be um, a leaf. It could be as we've just seen, um, you know, a limb of a, of a person. So you're starting, you're, you're, you've got a single line and then the line expands. And because the line has got wider, it means you can fit in two tesserae rather than one. And the line splits into two rather than the tesserae just getting fatter. And when you split those tesserae, you want to make sure that they're not the same size. Because if you do have them the same size, then you create create crosses 
which are also focal points that you want to avoid in your work. Um, and then that, that process continues as the space expands. So again, the line is split. And you keep building your lines in this way, um, but all the time you're doing it, you also are aware of those other rules that we talked about slightly earlier about not creating straight lines between, between the tesserae, not creating crosses. So then you have to keep tilting the tesserae to make sure that you're avoiding these, these lines. And so you carry on splitting and tilting and tilting and splitting as you build up the space. Um, so now I want to look at the ways of laying the background, um, the, laying the background of mosaics, which again have been used since um, ancient times and, and are still used now. So these are called the mosaic opuses or the opera, if we're going to be um, absolutely precise. So um, this is the the classic form of laying. So you've got the outline around the main elements, and then you've got the straight horizontal lines or straightish horizontal lines. And this is called opus regulatum. And then this is um, opus massivum, which is um, the lines are following the form and they're radiating outwards, like the, the ripples in a pond. This is opus I always get this wrong, so I'm just checking my notes because I can't pronounce it right. Pallad Palladanium. I want to say Palladanium, that's why I had to check, but no, Palladanium. Uh, and we would call this crazy paving, and this is filling in the background with uh, random shapes. And this is a common um, way of doing backgrounds, particularly in um, um, community work. And when you look at this, you think it's actually quite a really easy way to do um, a background. And I'm sure some of you are really familiar with this. It's actually fiendishly difficult to do, to get the spacing right so it looks harmonious. So this is, um, oh, it's gone out of my head who it, who it is, but it's a community project in Chicago. And you can see that they filled in the orange and yellow background with random um, shapes, while well, the leaves are random shapes too. And the spacing is, is not consistent and the shapes are not consistent. Um, but when you, this is on a huge scale, it actually works really well. So it depends on the scale and it depends on the mosaic, whether um, the consistency is, is crucial or not. And then this is a detail from Gary Drossel who I think you'll all be familiar with because he's, um, he's the one that does the ponds, the, the, the ponds that look like they're, they've got actual fish swimming in them with um, shadows. So he often fills in his backgrounds with um, rectangles and squares, which I really, which I think is a really lovely um, effect. Uh, and I think, in fact, I, I, in fact, I know because I've spoken to him that this is actually um, a, simply a time cutting measure. Um, so if you're working on a big commission, it's obviously going to spare save you time if you're working in larger pieces in the background than, than just using all squares. Um, so this is back to Palozzi at the Tottenham Court Road. Um, and this is opus um, regulatum, which simply means a grid pattern. This is opus vermiculatum. And this is a detail from uh, a Pompeii, a very famous mar marine scene in Pompeii. And vermiculatum, vermiculi, as you know from the pasta, means um, little worm. And basically, the uh, opus vermiculatum means um, is a style of mosaic which uses very, very tiny pieces and very fine um, setting and grading and, and coloring. Um, so they have a very painterly effect. So this is a detail from. Um, the judgment of Paris at the Louvre. Uh, and you can see that, well, you probably can't see because you can't get a sense of the, the size, but the tesserae are tiny and, and you end up with a very realistic effect. And this is opus vermiculatum. 
And then you have uh, opus circumactum, which is which are these uh, fan shapes, um, half yeah, these kind of fan shaped semicircles in the background. And I've I've tried to do this because it's such a beautiful effect, but actually it's fiendishly well uh, much more difficult than you think because of course you need loads of keystones. Um, so there it is again on the left and on the right. If you look closely, this is a, a, a threshold to a 19th century building in Edinburgh. And you can see it there. So it's a very simple design of a wreath, but yet the background is, is incredibly beautifully and finely executed in this lovely um, fan shape. And so this is just a little detail to show you that although there are these set ways of laying the background, there are also um, people just did what they could under the circumstances and um, working conditions. So if you look to the left of the flower, you can see sort of beginnings of the massive effect of the radiating lines. And then between the foot and the flower, there's, a, there's just the kind of crazy paving, you know, they've just kind of filled it in randomly. So um, yeah, and here is another uh, mosaic threshold from a shop in Edinburgh. And so this is more of this uh, lovely fan shape. Um, and I think this is a really interesting example because you've got this very fine, very elegant and flowing design. And then you've got the kind of fan shape, the movement that's going on in the background. And in a sense, these two things clash because the, the fan shapes are running contrary to the movement of the design itself. Um, but I think it works, and I'm not entirely sure why, because I think, in a way, it's a bit of a mess. But anyway, I think, it, I think it's interesting. Um, so this, um, and I've just put in, because it shows, again, that, that even though there are sort of standardized ways of laying in the background, the, these are often not, not applied. So this is one of my favorite examples, um, and it's in the Massimo Museum in Rome. So if you look on the left, all the lines are running horizontally, and if you look on the right, all the lines are running vertically. And I sort of think that's probably because lots, lots of people were working on it at the same time, and, and people working on the right weren't, weren't, weren't paying attention or chatting and, and vice versa with the people on the left. But I also think it might might also be a, a visual technique to to enhance the sense of the the head, the Medusa turning away. Um, I don't know. So now we're just going to look at um, the andamento a little bit more. So this is the flow or the direction of the movement of the um, tesserae within the mosaic. So I, I really love this piece, and this is by Emma Biggs, who's um, based in, in London. And so what I'm looking at here is the background, and then the background in, in contrast to the, the elements in the foreground. So the background is the gray, and then the elements in the foreground are the, the greens and yellows and oranges. Um, so Emma has sort of divided up this, um, the, the work very cleverly by changing the way she's set the background. So, so all of it is actually a grid. So breaking all the rules there, but some of it is set, some of it is a simple grid. Some of it, you know, you've got um, dark grays against light. Some, some of it, you've got these, this slight blue and, and, it, and it divides the piece into these different sections. And against that, you have the movement of these large um, pieces. It's for a kitchen, it's for an um, industrial kitchen. Um, you know, um, what am I thinking of? Like a, a restaurant, basically. And so you've got the movement in the, in the oranges and the greens moving against the straight lines. Um, and I just, I just love this piece. It's just so utterly, utterly brilliant because it is, and Demento. There's nothing else to it but this unbelievably wonderful, um, funny and Demento. Uh, most of them gone kind of crazy, the radiating out. 
So the andamento isn't just the movements um, in the background, but it's also the movement within the elements. So if you look in a um, kind of classic ancient, ancient mosaic like this one of a hen, um, you can see that the lines are following the direction that the hen, hen's feathers and body would, would go. So I've drawn that on to show what I mean. So the lines around the breast go foot curved down, and then the, the feathers on the wing are, are sort of curving across, um, and so on throughout the body. And the same with this fish, or the same with, with any um, anim animal element in an in a ancient mosaic. And this, and this is another really clear example from the Hackney Mosaic Project. So you've got the flow of the tesserae following the flow of the body and the movement of the, the creature. Um, and so when you get to faces, the andamento is absolutely critical because it's following um, the muscul musculature underneath the skin in order to create the the sense of liveliness, liveliness and movement and character of the face. Um, so I'm just, I put this one in, believe it or not, this is actually a Byzantine mosaic uh, from the Banaki Museum in Athens. Uh, and it's got no andamento at all. And you can see, you can see that it, either in the hair or in the face. So if you don't have andamento, you don't have a mosaic, or you certainly don't have a, a, a figurative or representational mosaic. Um, and this is a very, very beautiful example from El Jam Museum in um, Tunisia. And you can see that, that very interestingly and quite unusually, the andamento, it follows on um, from the design itself. So if you look at the tips of the feathers, uh, in, so we're looking, the feathers finish, and then you're looking at the white behind them, they're following the same direction as the feathers. Uh, and then this is something I made a, a few years ago, uh, which again is all about andamento. So it's a mosaic for a very large fireplace, which has been blocked in. Uh, and so what I, I didn't want the, the mosaic to kind of dominate the room. So I chose the subdued colors, but I, I wanted to imply the sense of movement and flickering and fire uh, by the andamento. So of course you have the, the kind of basic lines of the, the darker brown of the pattern, but the andamento in the background is how the piece works. Um, and this is another piece I did um, a while ago. So again, you've got this very simplified tree. It's a wedding mosaic, which is why you've got the uh, lettering at the bottom. Uh, so if you look beyond the leaves of the tree, you can see the andamento outlining the tree. So in order, again, as obviously a deliberate thing, in order to avoid the design being too bitty and too busy, I pared it down and allowed the andamento to do the work. And this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful piece by Julie Sperling called, um, the Canadian artist called Flip the System. And you can see that the andamento again um, is the work. The, the interlocking, the flowing, the movement of these, these beautiful lines is what the work is about. And here's an example from Rachel Sager again at the Ruins Project. And so, as, as many of you probably know, uh, Rachel's really interested in maps and topography. And so you've got the two, let's say, land masses on either, either side and, and the sea in between. Um, following what a fairly regular, you know, the, what we, how you'd expect the andamento to work, following the lines um, outlining the form. And then in the middle of the sea, you've got this wonderful twirling circle just thrown in there, and I should ask her why it's there, but, but I love it, because it shows how 
how much how important endomento is and, and how you know, a, a disruptive element like that can create a really can make a work much more interesting. Uh, and this is an example from Ravenna. Um, and I've chosen this because again, the andamento is what's you've got you've got the you know it's a religious scene, you've got the saint and the and and the apostle at the bottom and whatever else is happening further up the piece. But the andamento in the background is separating the different elements and, and making the visual interest is, is, is working to, in harmony with, with, the, um, with the elements. Um, so I love that piece. And, and now we're just, we're just finishing with my absolute most favorite example at all, of all of andamento. So this is in the metro in um, Athens, and you've got these little starlings, and seemingly a, a completely random placement of tesserae in the background. But I think the 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 fact that the tesserae are so small and they're and they're placed incredibly close together, sort of echoes the chattering of the birds. And I think it's just, just a brilliant, brilliant example of and, Andamento conserving the work. Um, so I'm just rounding off. I don't know how we're doing for time, um, but I'm just rounding off with this wonderful example of a um, mosaic that's gone completely wrong. And that's simply to show you that despite all of these rules and regulations, things can go a bit awry. Anyway, so there you go. That's, I finished. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry I hopped on, like, um, but I would love to open the floor for some questions. Um, if anyone would like to unmute and ask a question, you can feel free. Um, or if you'd like to write your questions in the chat, I can share them. Is, is anyone out there actually, um, doing um, sort of traditional work or are most of you contemporary mosaicists and, and proudly so? Feel free to speak up everyone. Um, I, I, can, I can say that I, I, having seen the work of a lot of the New England Mosaic Society members, there's actually quite quite a variety. Um, I think mm -hmm. there are people who work in um, with a lot of traditional techniques in their own work, some who teach that but don't but don't use them in their own work, and um, many who I would call contemporary mosaic artists, but um, mm -hmm. please feel free to speak for yourselves. <laughs> I'm just going to, now that I've just going to move my, my um, computer out of the sun, that might help. Oops. We've got some good comments here. Hold on. Oops. That's better. Okay, so um, you, you're getting you're getting kudos for um, a wonderful presentation. <laughs> good. And, um, and then we have a question, um, which is, what are your thoughts about combining mediums like mosaic with encaustic? Um, I haven't thought about that at all. I'd really love to see examples of that. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I, you know, I trained in a very traditional way because I trained trained in Greece, and I've been experimenting and exploring um, in many different ways. But I've never never with encaustic. Um, but I'm sure they would work very well together. Um, okay, we have another comment um, and question. I noticed in one example that grout actually created a form outline. Was this common? It seems more common today. So to use the grout line as an outline. Uh, yes, I think I think that's something that I mean I I explored with my students. Um, it's 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 if you think of the grout line as as pencil marks. Um, they're a really kind of key part of your work, and so therefore, a grout line as, a, as an outline can work extremely well. But it's 
you've got to be thinking about it. You can't just, um, you know, it's quite easy for that to happen um, spontaneously without you being aware, but it's important to control it and use it for your own ends is what I'd say about that. Um, so I, I do really love using the grout lines as, as part of the andamento, as part of the, the flow and the movement within the work. Um, but I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm not, I'm not letting that happen spontaneously, if that makes sense. That does indeed make sense. Yeah. Um, so Linda is saying that um, she's working on a Roman a copy of a Roman floor mosaic that involves oh. fish and uses wow. outlining and also enjoys blending colors to produce the illusion of volume. Um, I saw that in some of the examples that you shared. Mm. Mm. Um, one, I, I don't know, can I speak? Just, it's yes. Linda who's doing yes. the Roman. Um, the thing that I find myself not doing, um, I've done quite a number of Roman mosaics. I, I, I find it, you know, I, I go toward that rather than contemporary, <laughs> but I do, do both. But I, I find it very hard to work in square tessery. <laughs> Um, they tend to be rectangles, not big, just not square. Mm -hmm. And so they never end up looking quite like Roman <laughs> mosaic. But um, I don't know. Would you view that very negatively? Or <laughs> they well, are consistent. <laughs> well, uh, well that, that's great. I mean, I, I think the thing about rectangles is that they're directional. Mm -hmm. So... You know, uh, is obviously by the, by the fact that they're long and thin. So if they're yeah. if they're all moving in a, in one direction, then they'll point the eye in that direction. Or even if you've yeah. got, just got a single line going along, that that the eye will follow that line. I mean, if you look at this 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 example, even that's still on the screen, there are quite a few rectangles in there. So if you look at the mm. the kind of the second. Uh, wave to the right just behind that um you know there's all there's all kinds of different shapes i mean but i i would say that the square is an easier shape to control in terms of where the eye would is lies and where um, and the movement um mm. yeah okay so what, what is it what is it about squares that, that's the, um that's you know it, it's it's partly, um, I, I'm doing, the one I'm doing now is in um, small tea. And it's the shape of the small tea to begin with. Yeah. You, you waste an awful lot if you create oh. squares. That's true. That's very, that's uh, because very whichever, way, whichever way you look at it, it's the rectangle. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons. Um, I, I think I'm just not self-disciplined enough to make the squares. <laughs> but anyway, I enjoy it. And I, yeah. I love, as I mentioned in my chat, I, I love the gradations of color that I'm doing, you know, in the fish. It's, um, yeah, and there's, no, there's nothing quite like small tea for that. I mean, it's just right. such a beautiful um, material. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, Kim, so. I, I see your, your comment that you have an example of a Roman mosaic you made. Um, I'd, I'd love it if you could share that. Um, perhaps Amy might need to make you co-host to try to share, so I'll let you two work that out. Um, but in the meantime, um, mm. Helen, we have, a, we have a thank you from Cynthia Stanton that, for, for um, the humor that you add to ancient mosaics. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And also um, just another thank you here. So Amy, are you able to help? I'm, uh, who? I'm just going to stop my share because that means that you'll probably be, other people will be able to share. There we go, yeah. Where'd go? What was the name of the person who- Kim, Kim Alexander. Oh, okay. Let me find her. Or oh, Kim, you may be able to share. I'm not sure what our settings are. Okay, okay. So well- Co-host. You can yeah, hear now. I don't know why. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Hear you. Okay. I'm for some reason I'm having a problem with my screen, mm -hmm. but I can at least tell you that. Hold on. Let me see if I can. 
It's, uh, I made you a co-host, so she should be able to share your screen now. Okay, so let's see if you Hello. can. Hmm? Yeah. So, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so I, what I wanted to share, because it's hard to see, is this is my second one that I've made. Uh -huh. And I'm learning from it because I'm still making mistakes. And that's okay. It's just that this okay. is a yeah. lot of time to make this. But I'm finding that, you know, I'm, I'm, you can probably see some of the mistakes. Um, but they're not, they're not mistakes, which is, which is why I, which is why I put that uh, image up as the last. I mean, I, I think the, the beauty of Roman mosaics is their, is their differences. You know, they're, they're, they're all unique. They're all, none is, none is uniform. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I but there are there are these rules. So we'll use the word mistake only because it's it's. it's you know something, I'm fine with it because yeah. each time I make another one, I learn and I try and pay better attention to it. So oh. the offsets I find are difficult sometimes because you'll be doing an offset and then all of a sudden you're going to have the cross lines again. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. it's tre a treacherous business. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, we are getting very close to 12 o'clock here on the East Coast. Um, tell me, does anyone have a last comment or a question? Yes, um, I see you, Linda. Yeah, um, I noticed that Helen is not teaching in Greece next spring. Or oh, next early next summer. Have you stopped that now? Um, given uh, no, normally, as, as, as I was saying to Amy at the beginning, I normally do t one a year. And so I did two this year um, because it was we were just trying it out. Uh -huh. uh, and actually earlier in the year, I did it late June, early July, and it was it was basically too hot. It was quite uh -huh. hard. Um, so I, I've just come back from Greece for the, for the from the September class and it was the perfect temperature it was still still swimming and, and having a lovely time and eating outside and everything uh, mm -hmm. but it just wasn't 40 degrees so um yeah so that's why i'm just doing one in september next oh week. you are doing one okay oh, yeah, i'm doing one in september great thank you um, yeah um okay um amy would you like to close us out and i'll just say thank you thank you so much helen Yes. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm terribly excited to be here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, I just oh, wanted to can let you, everyone Can you give us know. the name of your book again, the one, and when it's coming out? It's coming out in March, and it's called Mosaics, Contem a Ancient Techniques to Contemporary Practice. I wanted to let everyone know that I'm working on the um, webinar schedule for 2023. And um, Diane Sonnenberg um, is going to be talking about the commission process, and that's going to be March 9th. Julie Ritchie is going to do a case study on the Queen of the Gulf large scale installation. And Laurel True will be talking about mosaic murals. So if you have anybody that you um, would like to hear from, any mosaic artists, let me know and um, I'll reach out to them. Helen, it was a pleasure having you. We loved your presentation mm -hmm. and thanks so much. How, can thanks can, you, can you share how to reach you, Helen? I mean, what's your email? Uh, sure, it's Helen Miles Mosaics at gmail.com. All right, I think I hope, I hope this generates a lot of new students and new interest for you. Thank you very much and thanks for inviting me. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.